Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today to talk about um, solutions uh, for GE aeroderivative gas turbines. Um, it would have spent a little time talking about various types of sensors uh, that PCB makes for these uh, specific uh, aeroderivative gas turbines. Um, before we get going too much, I wanted to tell you a little bit about PCB along with the modal shop. Um, PCB uh, it's a pretty big company. We're one of the largest, if not the largest, supplier of um, vibration uh, monitoring sensors in the world. Um, we were started out in 1967 in a little town outside of Buffalo called Depew, New York. Um, uh, the picture on the uh, on the right there, you see that's our headquarters building on the top, and then. Underneath that, there's a picture that shows our building along with our, our manufacturer, I mean, our, I'm sorry, our machining center, uh, which is about 50,000 square feet. Our very, very um, vertically integrated company, and we're able to control all of the flow of the components that we use to build our sensors and other products that we make because of, of our machining capabilities. Um, we are probably the only company that has this type of capability that makes make sensors. Um, so we do a lot of our manufacturing here in um, Depew, and we also do some in North Carolina as well. A lot of our industrial products are made in North Carolina in that facility. Um, we also have a lot of offices uh, for the company throughout Europe and Asia and the Middle East that are direct PCB offices, along with the rest of the world having uh, distributors. Um, a couple other little facts about PCB. We were acquired by Amphenol Corporation just a couple of months ago. So we're still going through a change there. We don't really know uh, what's, what to expect, but you know, I don't think, and we don't expect there to be any major changes in the company itself. Um, another fact, we have, we bought um, in Devco a couple of years ago. So we are integrated in Devco with into PCB um, not too long ago. So that's still still something we're working on, but we're just about past all the issues related to that. Um, again, we are probably the world leader in, in making sensors for industrial applications, um, sensors for the power generation industry, aerospace and defense, automotive, uh, test and measurement markets, rail. I mean, we. We are, make special sensors for just about every market out there. Also are the one of the top suppliers of high temperature turbines for um, major OEMs um, in the world. Not a lot of OEMs left, there's GE Siemens, you know, and a couple others, and we supply sensors to all of these OEMs for their new gas turbines. Um, another product we make for these OEMs is uh, dynamic pressure sensors for monitoring uh, combustion dynamics uh, of the uh, gas turbines. Mobile Shop, um, who's actually our main host for these this webinar series, and I want to thank them for allowing us to do these. Uh, they are uh, a Cincinnati, Ohio-based company um, founded in 1990. Uh, they were a PCB group company up until um, recently. Uh, but you know they're and they're still they're still in our family with Amphenol, and they're a world leader of dynamic sensor calibration systems and services. Uh, they can do uh, calibration in a lab or in a field. They can provide calibration certificates. They can check uh, check any type of sensor in our facility in in Cincinnati. They also as a they manufacture, which I'll talk about at the, toward the end of the presentation, a portable vibration calibrator, which is a really great field instrument for testing uh, accelerometers and other types of vibration-related sensors in the field, um, and along with proximity probes. So I'll get into that a, a little later in the uh, presentation. Uh, this is a list of our group companies uh, with in Amphenol and PCB, um, and PCB, of course, Modal Shop, IMI Sensors, which is part of PCB, um, and Devco, Temposonics, which makes uh, position and liquid level sensors, 
Acumetrics does um, some generator monitoring products. And Larson Davis uh, focuses a lot on industrial hygiene, uh, sound meters, and that type of products. A little bit about me. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer. I've been in the energy market uh, and focused on for the most part, PowerGen uh, for over 25 years. Um, I've got a lot of experience in, in industrial products, instrumentation and applications. Um, I've, I've been around a long time looking at those, focusing on, on all kinds of uh, applications, um, pulp and paper, steel, mining, um, and along with, uh, with PowerGen uh, for a long time. I used to work with uh, SKF condition monitoring and vibrometer in my past. I've been with PCB for, well, I think five years now. Um, again, a lot of focus on gas turbines and uh, GE aero derivatives over the years. Um, and I've been a member of uh, the Western Turbine Users Group uh, since I believe the late 90s. And my position at PCB today is a business development manager. Uh, I'm a category three vibration analyst. Um, for many years ago, I I was uh, I became uh, that level, and um, I've been an API 670 committee member for about 20 years. Um, looking over the, um, I think we're on the fifth edition of API uh, now, uh, which mostly focuses on um, oil and gas instrumentation. So. Overall, uh, you know, all of our uh, group companies, um, we look over vibration uh, monitoring system verification, uh, ground fault, proximity probe troubleshooting, combustion dynamics, industrial hygiene, um, tank levels, and we have um, sensors that can monitor uh, hydro machinery, um, slow speed monitoring as well. We have some products uh, as well that are compatible with uh, Industry 4.0, um, and we're evolving more and more into that every day. So back to the, this presentation on GE LM aero derivatives. We're going to talk a little bit about the gas turbines and the types, um, a little bit on the vibration monitoring strategy, uh, where the sensors are mounted. Um, and we'll get into a few slides about the PCB high temperature accelerometers and vibration, I mean, and uh, dynamic pressure sensors. Um, and then talk about testing and calibration equipment um, towards the end. So uh, people have asked over the years, I was the one that asked uh, maybe even um, 15 years ago what an LM stands for, and it stands for land and marine. So when you hear about LM gas turbines, that stands for land and marine. Um, and it's uh, it's GE's power plant platform of flight engines. So all of the uh, GE LM aeroderivatives are based on uh, engines uh, that are in, in flight. And they take them, package them, and, uh, and make them into uh, ground-based turbines. Um, the LM2500 has been around a long time, um, the 5000, the 6000, um, then they've got a trailer mounted version of the uh, LM2500, and then uh, in recent years they've come out with uh, what they call the LMS100, which is a 100 megawatt land marine supercharged um, heavy duty or, or gas turbine that is part of an aero engine and also uses uh, part of a GE 7FA heavy duty gas turbine. There's a couple other vari variations. Uh, they made an LM600 uh, for a short time that followed the 2500. And, and then um, Baker Hughes is currently working on uh, the next uh, um, aero derivative, which is an LM9000. And I'm not really going to talk much about that because that's still in uh, a trial mode. Go back to the each each turbine type aeroderivative. Um, the 2500 was uh, released in in uh, 1969. Um, there's there's 
over 2,000 or 2,300 units operating um, with an over 90 million operating hours. Uh, they had uh, some various configurations over the years, ranging from a 22 megawatt output to 37 megawatt output. Um, for the most part, today the uh, LM2500 is used for um, propulsion. Um, you know, drives there. There you see them a lot in, in pipelines, pumping in pumping stations, and also offshore power generation. They aren't really used a lot um, for onshore power generation these days. The LM5000 um, came out in 1978. Um, they made it for about 20 years. There wasn't a lot of them ever produced had a power output of about um, almost right under 40 megawatts. Um, they made up a little over 100 of them, and I still hear that, that those are still in service. A lot of them, I know some of them have been taken out. Um, more recently, I don't know how many, but I, I think there's probably still um, 80, 80 to 90 in service. Um, these were put in use typically for uh, cogeneration applications. That's where they were were sold for, um, and this engine, um, kind of popular when it was introduced and, and halfway through, but it helped pave the way for a even bigger and more successful um, aero derivative, which is the LM6000. So LM6000 uh, came out in 1991. Um, it's got over 13 units operating worldwide today. Um, it had several, several different platforms um, and several designations after the LM6000, the PA, the PC, the PG. And then there were several versions that were also uh, made with uh, they were DLE, which is dry low emissions, um, for looking at, you know, certain emission standards um, that had to be met depending on when where they were installed. And uh, for the most part, they've been uh, between 40 to about 55 megawatt units, depending on the model. Um, PG um, has been rated at 54 max. I'm not sure I've ever seen any running at 54 megawatts, but that's what uh, GE uh, advertises. I've seen these uh, used as base load and peaking power generation, combined cycle cogen, and mechanical drives a little bit in uh, in pipelines. Not not uh, as much as a 2500, but there are some of these used for that. But you know, somebody asked me a question the other day about the, these are just peaking um, error derivatives, aren't they? I'm like, no, there's a lot that are based on, there's some, there's some plants that were built with several LM6000s uh, that are strictly baseload uh, power stations. So uh, when the LM6000 came out, um, it was known, known for a fast start um, for immediate demand. Um, five minutes, uh, it, it could go from from um, cold to uh, you know full output of power. LM100, LMS100, uh, a supercharged version, um, began operating in 2006. Um, GE had started working on that uh, in the early 2001, I believe, and. Um, they had some issues with it at the beginning. Um, I think I think today most of those issues are past GE, and they produce about a hundred uh, megawatts at full load, um, based on a CF6 ADC2 aero engine, which I believe is in a 747 um, uh, airplane. And uh, the low pressure compressor compressor is based on the GE6FA uh, industrial gas turbine. So they, this was kind of a cross between. GE's uh, frame style, um, heavy duty gas turbines, and, and the aero engine. Um, it is the largest and most efficient unit today. Um, so it can pr produce full power of about 100 megawatts in 10 minutes, but it can start up to 75% load in about five minutes. So it's available for immediate demand needs as well, if, if that's needed. So typically, um, the monitoring strategy is, is simple on most of these 
simple yet complex. I mean, the mounting of the sensors is, is pretty is pretty simple. Um, some of the mono, um, the way they monitor and look at the vibration levels is is somewhat uh, uh, I want to say complex to some degree. Um, the way uh, GE does it, um, most of their vibration levels are based on um, just common guidelines um, and they changed that a lot as as the units were in commercial operation and changed what they thought they should be based on um, units that began operating and getting up to full load. Um, all these requirements for vibration monitoring um, are in the uh, installation design manual, um, what the limits are. And all of these, all of these um, LM, and LMS 100 units are equipped with high temperature accelerometers and a lot of other vibration monitoring um, instruments as well. So typically uh, these units, they, they come with two uh, high temperature accelerometers per engine. Uh, sometimes in a customer, when a customer ordered an engine, they, they, an option was to have four. And I've seen I've seen units with four. That's just poor redundancy. Uh, if you know they have a failure, they want to, especially on baselift plants uh, with LM six thousands, you would see this uh, four sensor setup. They have two um, dynamic pressure sensors, high temperature um, per engine. That's newer again, newer units. Um, there's one on there's one on older older LMs. Um, there's industrial accelerometers on the gearbox, and this is strictly for 50 hertz um, applications, which we don't see um, in the U.S. at all. But there's a reduction gearbox on 50 hertz um, LM units, uh, so they install industrial accelerometers on those. Uh, alternators on these have uh, proximity probes, typically four and I should have put a thrust. They always have a thrust probe as well on the end of the uh, generator alternator. Um, so all these sensors run into um, a machinery protection system of some kind. Um, uh, today it's it's mainly the Bentley Nevada 3500 system. You do see rarely some other systems out there monitoring these, but it's it's pretty much the the Bentley Nevada 3500. Kind of overview of uh, how everything is installed. Um, the four, the uh, accelerometers, the high temperature accelerometers are forward and aft sensors, so they're they're monitoring the LP and HP side and the HP and LP side of the turbine. Um, looking at vibration, they're kind of the mount, which you'll see a picture of in a minute, is kind of in the middle between these two sections, and then the uh, combustion monitoring sensors are mounted. Uh, in the combustor, so there's there's two sensors. Typically, um, they call those DP1 and DP2. And then back to the uh, gearbox monitoring on a 50 hertz unit. It's just they're just monitoring high speed and low low speed shafts. So looking at the bearings on those for potential faults. Um, and then on the generator, there's the uh, radial uh, displacement probes and also a thrust probe on the end of the generator uh, mounted. X and Y uh, positions 90 degrees apart. Um, again, all this feeds into a um, machinery protection system. And there's a lot of, uh, in that protection system, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in there, looking at uh, certain vibrational levels based on speed. Um, so it's looked at, it's looking at different speeds as a, as a unit comes up and looking at vibration levels at certain speeds. And I've, I have many, many times seen these, uh, LM turbines, mainly the older 2500s and 5000s, actually trip while they're coming up uh, to run. Uh, LM 6000s, not as often, but yeah, they do. They have tripped coming up to speed. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that, um, which is probably too much for this presentation, but usually I've seen the operators just bypass that alarm. And, and uh, after they've tripped, they just start it back up and, and ignore that alarm when they bring it up.
so depending on the model of of the uh, aero derivative, um, we at BCB we manufacture high temperature accelerometers and dynamic pressure sensors uh, for these. So uh, I would you know just about every every unit out there has either an accelerometer or a dynamic pressure sensor that we uh, can manufacture. Um, the accelerometers used on different engines uh, have a lot of different uh, configurations and cable lengths and I think uh, GE specified this just to confuse customers and make it difficult to keep spares and also to sell more sensors directly. Um, because uh, even even one unit has a uh, the R6000 has a accelerometer forward and aft, and one's 48 inches long cable, and the other has a 49 inch long cable, and you can't interchange them, even though that inch because of that inch, but also the connector is different on the end, so you can't interchange them. So you got to keep two sensors in stock uh, for spares. The um, dynamic pressures on uh, the DLE um, based derivatives are typically the same and used across all um, LM6000 units. So it's a, we'll see a picture of that in a minute, but it's typically always the same sensor. Not typically, it is always the same sensor. They never change that. This is a, the PCB version of the high temperature accelerometer that is on. LM2500s, 5000s, 6000s, 1600s, 1, as well. These are these are the style of sensors that's used. Um, our sensors are actually a um, little different than the OEMs, where ours are um, intrinsically safe and ATAX approved, where the OEM sensors, which are made by somebody else, are not. Um, but they're actually drop in replacements. Um, so they're gonna have the same cable length, the same connector, um, the output of the sensor is exactly the same. So there would be no changes that have to be made to use a PCB sensor in place of the GE OEM sensor. Um, we have all, all cable and connection connector options available. So in a minute, we'll see a list on the next slide of uh, different configurations. We, we we have all those available, and most of these are in stock or they have very short lead times um, for us to, to build. So these are just a little list of our part numbers. Um, these are the sensors that we build, and, and these are the ones that we would typically have in stock with these cable links and these connector styles. Uh, the, the the one in the in the middle there with the, with no cable is typically on older older LM2500s. They don't have an integral cable, but you know that's an easy one for us to make without an integral cable. So we will keep that in stock and all these others as well. Um, little picture up there. I just wanted to go over that one. And the, um, there was another one before, but I won't go back. This is a people ask me when they see this picture. Um, about why why they why didn't they mount that sensor straight? It looks like it's crooked on the mounting plate, and it is. And it's supposed to be because if it if it was if they did try to mount that straight, it would be um, in the way of that cable where the cable enters the sensor because it, it hit that um, bracket that's holding up the uh, the piping underneath. So they're purposely mounted um, slightly off, um, and it drives me crazy. Is when I see these pictures or, or go and crawl underneath a aero derivative and see them mounted crooked, just I'm, I'm weird like that. Um, the aero derivative uh, dynamic pressure sensors uh, are built built uh, based on our our 176 series sensors. Um, we make a version that's the identical footprint um, mounting of the OEM pressure sensors. Um, and these as well are ATEX and um, intrinsically safe. Um, the OEM versions are not always uh, hazardous area approved. And with these, um, 
the, the head's always going to be the same, but sometimes the cable length might be different again. On the LM6000 that has two of these, they have two different cable lengths. Um, the connectors are the same, but they do use two different cable lengths on these, just so customers um, spend a lot of money on spares. Um, and these as well are um, typically in stock or have very short lead, lead times if you place an order for these. Um, these are the, there's, there's different versions of these, as you can see. Um, that, that picture on the right is, is how they mount um, on a combustor. That's, that is a combustor of an LM6000. And uh, they mount just like that with that bracketry and that picture um, on the bottom of the chart there. It kind of shows what it looks like um, on the other side of the bracket. Uh, that sensor on the left is, is an AO176 uh, AO4, and it's a three hole mount sensor. And that's what I, where I've seen that most of the time is on a. Uh, LM 2500 uh, for monitoring uh, dynamic pressure on that. And it's a real easy, simple to mount sensor. Uh, it, is, it is high temperature, uh, but it's a little different mounting uh, than this one. Uh, so when we when we sell this sensor um, with the bracket, that all comes together in one piece, one package. We supply the whole, the whole works with the bracket. So why are, why are uh, High temperature sensors installed in gas turbines, um, you know, they have to be because uh, of the temperatures. Um, we make a lot of high temperature accelerometers and dynamic pressure sensors. We also make a lot of uh, ICP driven sensors, um, a lot of those, which, and they can only handle 250 degrees Fahrenheit because uh, their electronics cannot handle higher temperatures than that. Where, we make high temperature accelerometers and pressure sensors that can handle up to 1400 degrees F. Um, and these sensors are all very accurate. Um, they don't require maintenance at all. Um, they typically should last a lifetime. So if you had a gas turbine running and you let that sensor installed all the time and probably never took it off for any reason, I, I would say it's going to last a lifetime. Um, but typically causes problems is when the sensors are removed for, you know, when there's maintenance being done and they might be banged around or dropped or, you know, something like that would cause the sensor to, to fail. Um, even more common, um, these sensors, the, the installation of them, if they're changed out for whatever reason, is, is not done the same way. So the cables will rub on something. So it rubs uh, against that armor over braid hardline cable and it rubs through and once that happens that that can't be repaired so you got to buy a new sensor the uh, next is going into the calibration um, we have vibration calibrators um, these are manufactured by the modal shop uh, we call them um, part number 699 b06 and b07 there's two versions um, the B07 can provide calibration reports and it has some other features as well. But with this uh, portal vibration calibrator, you can test any type of vibration instrument, accelerometers, uh, proximity probes, vibration switches. Uh, of course, our high temperature charge mode accelerometers can be tested on these and calibrated or verified. Um, and you can also uh, validate. Uh, vibration acquisition devices. So you could inject a signal into a measuring chain and uh, make sure that your alarm levels are are proper and everything does what it's supposed to do when you hit those cru crucial alert and alarm li limits. Um, again, it's a very portable unit. The battery in it um, typically lasts for a day of use, you know, off and on as you're using it on the field. It's it's pretty lightweight, easy to carry. It's, it's again, very, very portable. Uh, this device is, is a charge uh, sensor or ICP sensor simulator. Um, it's made by our sister company in Devco. So it just, uh, it's a real simple unit that provides an output with a variable frequency and amplitudes and sensitivity depending on the system. 
So it's a real simple, easy to use product for verifying a signal change. So you would basically disconnect the sensor and then use an adapter cable that goes from the BNC, BNC to this to whatever you're using, uh, accelerometer or pressure sensor. And uh, inject that signal and you can test the, the, the measuring chain, the rest of it out, uh, external to the sensor to make sure all that's right. And it's, again, a great device for just testing the integrity of the, um, of the sensor chain without the sensor. So, you know, if you're not sh sure if it's accelerometer or cable, you know, this is a, is a great way to check it and very inexpensive unit as well. So, why would you switch from the OEM sensors to um, PCB high temperature sensors? Um, one is we've, we've got many and most models in stock ready to ship. And if we got them in stock, we can almost always ship the same day. All, all of the sensors um, I've talked about are drop-in replacements for the GE aero derivatives. Um, and we also have drop-in replacements for other OEM gas turbines so it's not just ge aerodynamic it's, it's all the others as well um, some of our real high temperature sensors are built with uh, what we call uht 12 um, which is a crystal inside and, and it it's a great crystal that eliminates spiking um, during temperature transient so i've seen this a lot in the in the past um, when i've been on site looking at uh, Customers unit, um, which is causes sometimes for them to to trip while they're they're going up, uh, uh, starting up the turbine. Um, there'll be a system spike because of the temperature is changing, so you get a, a temperature transient spike in the signal, and sometimes that could last for you know a couple seconds, which would cause it to trip offline. And our our UHT uh, sensors uh, with the UHT crystals are really smooth um, during temperature transients. So there's no spiking in the signals as the temperature increases on the sensors. Um, the other reason to switch is all these are, are intrinsically safe where other OEM sensors are not. So, you know, a lot of people don't know that, but yeah, the, the uh, GE sensors are not intrinsically safe, have no approvals on them whatsoever. Uh, and you might have a plant that requires that um, on the unit. I mean, this is a gas turbine. It could be a gas leak. You probably want to make sure that it is an uh, intrinsically safe sensor. A big reason you would switch is cost. Uh, I've seen the sensors go up. Um, you know, that uh, the pressure sensor with that bracket tree for the OM6000, um, I've seen those priced uh, anywhere from Fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars per sensor, and we aren't gonna. We don't charge that much. We have a list price. I don't know what it is offhand. I'm not a price guy, but it is. It is much less than that. Um, and the same with the uh, with the accelerometers. They're a lot less expensive than what we buy them from. Pay for them from GE. Okay, good, good stuff. Well, thank you, um, Amanda, and everybody that joined today. I hope you learned something. Feel free to send me an email or give me a call. My number's on the screen now, and uh, I can answer, you, answer any other questions you might have or give you our part numbers to cross over or whatever, whatever you need. Let me know. Everybody Thank you so much, Dave. Take care, guys.